Yeah, we're live. <laughs> I missed this by a couple seconds, but we are indeed live. I'm going to go ahead and bring this down just a little bit. So tonight we're going to talk about making things adjustable. So I'm going to show you the photo that I have up, which is the thumbnail. And this is what this are, these are. This is uh, adjustable headers or adjustable header since this is on a four cylinder. This particular one was done for a book that I wrote called <laughs> B Segment Performance. All the little cars, Toyota Yaris and all the little Scions and Honda Fit and things like that. And what I did, because when I did this book, there were there was not a lot to choose from. <laughs> there were not a lot of long tube headers for a Toyota Yaris. So because I needed to do this book and get it done and do all this testing, if there isn't something available, then you got to do it yourself. And so what I recommend for people when they're trying to do that, whether you're trying to make an intake manifold, because, you know, we've talked many times about different runner lengths, same thing happens with primary length on headers. So if you have a header and you want to optimize it, <laughs> look at my lighting keeps changing, and you want to optimize it for your application, the best way to do that, you can, we have guys that are really, really sharp that can do math. You can take a look at the, the exhaust programs and stuff. but I've never seen anybody be able to use those and do what actual testing does. So we've had guys come in from Burns Stainless and they're really good and they have <laughs> they have lots of data and they brought headers in and they had to continually change it to make it better than what was there. And so it's it's so much easier for you to run something and then change something and then run it and change it and run it and change it with a header that you've made to make that happen. So in, in my case, what we did was we made a long tube header and we made the, and I think Tom that, that worked at West Tech did this, probably did this header for me if I remember right. And we just, you know, had it come down and bend underneath the car. And then from that point, everything else were just slip bits. So we had the collector and then everything in between that and that section of tubing that bends down, all of that's just slip bit stuff. So we can make the header as short as we can going from that piece just to the collector and then start adding collector length. Now, obviously there's a limit to how far you can extend that and how far you would want to extend that given the combination of, because the header, the primary length is gonna have to work with cam timing and intake manifold runner length and stuff because th those two things kind of need to be matched so that you can get the, you know, you don't, you don't have cross modulation of the, <laughs> of the reflected waves of the positive and negative reflected waves. But when you do that, because, and the other thing that's going to happen is when you change primary length, just like when we change intake runner length, you're going to come across combinations where it, you know, makes more power here, less power here. So ultimately you're going to have to decide, Hey, what is the, what is the compromise? Unless you have a, you know, slidable header primary tube, um, you're going to have to decide what is the optimum you know, what is the optimum trade-off combination for this motor or, or for this design? It, it always comes out that way. You're going to find one, that, oh, this made a lot of low speed power. Hey, this one made a lot of top end power. This one makes kind of mid-range. What do I want? What is the best combination of those? And again, the best is in air quotes because there may be guys that want the big end power. There may be guys that want all the low speed power. There may be guys that want more you know, peak torque in the middle of the torque curve. That's wholly subjective, even though you could make that happen, you know, to some extent with this change in header, what is going to be the optimum one? What is going to be the right one? And you're going to have to decide that. But the only way you can decide that for yourself, for your combination, if there's something that you want to buy or something that you want to sell, something you want to make and, and offer, this is the way to go about it. You you make it so that it's adjustable. Same thing with all the intake manifolds that I do. Make them adjustable, and then then you just get frustrated and like I want all the top end of the small one, and and I want all the you know low speed power of the long one. I want all that, but you can't have that. So you have, again, you have to decide. It's the same thing with headers. Although the headers made the primary length made much less of a difference than intake runner length did, but there's still some there, and and it's and it's worth trying. A lot of times, what we get on headers from the aftermarket is we get stuff that fits. So for instance, shorty headers are a really good example of that. So if we take a shorty header and it has to go from the cylinder head to this stock pipe because they, you don't want to change where the cat is and any of that. 
you don't want to have, because if you can sell just a header, that's much easier than selling a header that like a, a mid-length header that has to have a different cat pipe or catless pipe or whatever for racing applications, whatever you're doing. If it requires more purchase and it requires more cost, guys are much less likely to buy it. If you can make it so that it's a standalone piece, that's why shorty headers, you know, are, are going to end up being, you know, within the, it's all going to fit within this box. It has to come off of the head port. It has to turn, they have to merge together and it has to end right here. There's only going to be so many ways that you can do that. So it's, it's going to be a fixed thing. So in some instances, you're limited in what you can actually design. And a long tube header too, you can't, you know, anymore, I don't think guys would be okay with cutting fender wells to make a header go out and, and you know, long tube header on a V8, let's say, go out and miss a steering column or something, you know. So there are limitations on it. It all has to go like all four of those whole or, or all four of those primary tubes all have to merge together and go fit past right here. They have to go past the oil pan or and 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 miss the motor mount and miss the frame rail and miss the miss the um uh the bell housing and the um uh firewall all of that stuff it has to be you know maybe maybe miss other things and so <laughs> again it's gonna almost dictate what the header design has to be and this has to turn and go under it has to not drag on the ground it has to fit in the trans tunnel and and wherever they had provisions for the exhaust it all has to fit there and so it gets difficult to be real clever and creative about what your header is going to be so again you you may want a 40 inch primary length well there isn't room to put that under there so you may be okay we can only fit a 30 inch or 32 inch or something like that with the collector and the cat and whatever you want in there um and, and the rest of the pipe so sometimes you're limited but even for us when we tested this we just wanted to see what header was going to do so we ran an exhaust after this that had nothing to do with fitting it in the car. We wanted to find out first what performance was and then figure out, okay, well, we have the performance. Now, what can we do to whittle away if we need, if it doesn't fit, what do we do to whittle away to make it fit? And can we, how much are we going to have to sacrifice? As it turned out, we wouldn't have had to sacrifice anything because the header that we wanted um, would have fit without any problem. I didn't want to go in and manufacture headers, but I made this for the test and was able to see the power differences of what we did. And it was very cool. And I love doing that. I love making the things adjustable. It takes more work on the front end, but when you go to do the dyno, you know, your life is just so much simpler on an exhaust. You have to wait till it's not hot, but otherwise it's all very simple. You know, like with the runner length, Oh, we just take this off and take the two inch one out and put the four inch one in and all of a sudden, Hey, we got two more inches of runner length. Same thing with the header. Um, we just made, you know, you could make two inch sections or four inch sections or combinations of those and go, oh, I'm going to take the two out, put the four inch in. Now I'm going to put the two back in now at six inches and you, and you go about it that way. But then, then you can test in steps and you can do that actually very quickly because you have to, you, you make those changes in the exhaust and then you might have to do a little bit of adjustment of air fuel um, and, and, and make that work. The, you're probably not going to see a change in timing requirements from that change in that change in the header. So you, you can try that and see what happens, but usually the, the header is not going to dictate that. But we did a lot of testing on that, and I had to make more than just, in fact, I'll show you guys what that looked like so you guys can see what I'm talking about. So this was the this was the adjustable header here. We had, we had a singular O2 sensor here because we were testing that, and then we had another one over here. But you can see just, you know, slip fits, different lengths. Pretty simple. Uh, you want to make it, you know, when you're making it, it's just going to be a test piece, and it's not going to be, you know, it's not a finished piece. You want to make it so it's easy and it fits and, you know, it's quickly adaptable, basically. Because you shouldn't spend a lot of time making it perfect because it's never going to be used other than for this. So uh, Tom, I think, did that and, and it bolted on and did all the things that we wanted it to do as a test piece and as an adjustable test piece. And we were able to do that and it was <laughs> it was kind of awesome. So I highly recommend that you make adjustable headers, intake manifolds, you can't really make an adjustable cylinder head. That, that would be awesome. But an adjustable port volume would be would be kind of cool. I was just watching the earlier live stream. See? And and yet we have another one. Boss 260, you, you are you Australian? Because that would be awesome. First time back on the lives in a while. RC, what's up? Good to have you back. 
modular power. Good to see all of you. Have you tried an adjustable collector? Um, we've tried adjustable collector lengths um, a lot, and, and there definitely is um, change in the length of the collector extension. But do you want to adjust the collector by merging different pairs together or something? How, how did you want, how else did you want to adjust that? So right off the bat, since we're there, we'll go to live chat. We do need to have a poll right now. So you guys that are here, let me know. What should the poll be? Engage with your audience. Solenoid operated valve train, adjustable cam. Yeah. You're established at the apartment? Nice. Yeah, getting a solenoid adjustable valve train would be difficult, they found. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's easy to say and very difficult to do. But an, an infinitely adjustable cam timing would be cool, but there are limitations in that too. Because the camshaft, no matter what you do to it, no matter how wild or mild you, you make it, you can improve the power from, let's say you have some setup. So you have some cylinder head, you have some intake manifold, you have some header, you have some compression and displacement. Even if you were to make the cam infinitely adjustable, that would be awesome. But you're still limited in power output by all of these other things. So the cam isn't going to turn your 100 horsepower 2 liter into a 500 horsepower 2 liter because cams can't do that. Biggest problem is people use too large of a primary pipe diameter to start with. This can slow exhaust gas flow and cause adverse effects on other processes. That's the biggest problem with exhaust. Seems like such a good idea in practice. It does. We we want, believe me, I want it to work. <laughs> I want it to have I want to have infinitely adjustable cam timing. Because then it would just make VTEC look, oh, that's just silly. <laughs> because you could have all of the variations of lift and duration and advance and retard and all the things, and it would be cool. And and it would do all the things that you'd want. But again, within the box of what any sort of cam timing can do. Question, did you ever check runner orientation clocking in the collector versus how it aided power? You mean by pairing different pieces? I don't think we did on this one. Let's see. No, because we didn't change the pairing on that. And I don't remember if we, I have to go back and look at my other photos on this. So this is all four into one, but I'm wondering if we did try wise on this too. I'd need to go back and look and see, because that would kind of be cool. If you check runner length on something like a tri -white, yeah, we've made adjustable tri -white hitters before and it does the same thing. If 200 CFM supports four, you mean 200 CFM of worth of head flow is the is the formula that you're using there. That's what I think it is. How does it how does CFM relate to four cylinder? 200 CFM will support 200 horsepower. It's half of that. Free valve type system can theoretically have the perfect cam at any given RPM all at once with enough tuning. Yeah, we, that's what we discussed. But but even if it has the optimum cam timing at any RPM or throttle opening or whatever. Let's let's go to wide open throttle just because it's easy to discuss. So let's say you have the optimum cam timing at 2000 RPM. You still have a fixed intake runner length and a fixed throttle valve opening and a fixed compression and a fixed head flow and a fixed exhaust, some kind of header or whatever. So cam timing from uh, an infinitely adjustable cam to a cam that we already have like, I don't think the gains are going to be, you know, it's not going to be a hundred foot pounds there. It's going to be, it's going to be less than we want it to be, I think. 
Easy way to make adjustable port volume, section the head into three or four pieces out of billet and just stack the sections for different port volumes. That would be cool. Yeah, Koenigsegg, a long time ago now, had that free valve motor, but it didn't, I don't think it became something. I think everybody thought that that was going to be a big thing and and it's and it's not unfortunately I'd like it to be They still use free valve technology but everybody's not doing it right It is very cool I mean and we talked about this before Koenigsegg was doing this cuz they were they were trying it on Formula 1 they were trying they tried all kinds of stuff electric valves and solenoids and things hard hard to get them to open and close the valve at higher pm free valve doesn't Leonard Skitter say that he also you could find a Merc cruiser yeah we've talked about that inline four cylinder that uses the big block Ford head You're Tim, you're from Kentucky. Are you out by Brian Tooley? How do you calculate how much horsepower a given head flow will support per cylinder? Well, on a V8, if you have uh 200 horse, if you have 200 CFM on a V8, that can a rough idea is it could support 400 horsepower. It may not because if you don't have enough camshaft, you don't have a cylinder head, you don't have a good enough intake or carburetor or fuel injection or whatever, it might not do that. It can do that. And it can actually do more than that. There are people that make way more than two horsepower per CFM. Race engines do that. So that's a rough idea. And then you can divide that by eight if you want to find out how much it is per cylinder. Uh, testing primary lengths is a great information. I'm debating long tubes and the pain of making a Y pipe or just getting shorts that fit an F body. The nice thing about getting things that just fit <laughs> and bolt on is it's a lot easier on all of us. And and if you're running boost or something, it's, it, you know, I like headers. I like long tube headers, but they are, they can be problematic though. Yeah, BMW is not cheap either. Your Stroker Windsor with a stock head produced amazing torque, way more than math would lead you to think. It it produced, um, the torque is not surprising because the airflow requirements for the motor are come at usually higher engine speeds. So it has enough airflow to support a fairly big low speed horsepower number, which is what we're talking about for torque. So it has the airflow to do that. Like if you think about a throttle body, a throttle body works pretty well down low, even a restrictive one. And the higher you go and the more airflow required by the motor, the more restrictive the throttle body gets. It's the same thing with head flow. Um, the thing that I was amazed by, and this is one thing that we were talking about with how much power you can make uh, per CFM of head flow, the stock head did very well on that big motor, but only because it had such a big draw. The 392 basically made our head flow more because now it was flowing at more than 28 inches of vacuum because the, the draw from that 392 was more than that. So it, it was sucking so hard that it increased the flow rate of the head. And it did really well. It made way over two horsepower per CFM. Is there any advantage to what you do with the exhaust after the collector, i.e. X-pipe or single exhaust? Yes, there is. X-pipes obviously make change the, the sound quality. X-pipes and H-pipes and Y-pipes, and all of that can change the power output. Although in the testing that the guys from Engine Masters did, the X-pipes and the H-pipes and the dual and normal dual exhaust didn't show a big change in power. I mean, it showed some, but not... Not where that's where I would be looking for huge gains. John, what's up? The Venturi effect as velocity increases, pressure decreases. Not much different. Ch -ch 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 -ch. 
Problem with the log exhaust manifold, there's always an exhaust valve open with high pressure when another cylinder is on a low pressure overlap period. The general rule, the farther you get from the cylinder head, the smaller the difference. Yeah, Kyle, although <laughs> guys make lots of power from log manifolds on turbo applications. Pulls should be shorty headers that fit versus long tubes that require work to make fit. <laughs> yeah. We'll do something along that line. Okay, shorty headers are, are a better choice than long tubes because, because they fit and are easy to bolt on. And are easy to bolt on. Okay, here we go. There's our pull. Let me know what you guys think. Back with more questions. Have been trying to finalize the cam I want to use. You have a video talking about drivability, specifically around town. Nope. None of the stuff I do on the engine dyno has to do with drivability. I mean, I can tell you from experience probably about drivability or some of the guys here that have tuned the cams that we talk about. Essentially, a smaller, milder cam is going to drive much better. Try to find a video about idle vacuum. I don't know that you're going to find idle vacuum. I, I have idle vacuum stuff on a lot of the stock cams that we did. I thought that I put that in there. I know I did the data. What about collector size? Is there a steadfast size that works well versus some calculation of the individual runner cross-sectional area? So you want a collector diameter? I can tell you that we run a, a wide variety of different collectors, most of them, most of which I think are too big for what we're running. Like we run... Um, you know, four, 4 4.8 liter LS motors with inch and seven eighths headers that have three inch collectors. And I think that some of the stuff like the new, uh, show, they, the guys from West Tech just had Schoenfeld do some more had new headers for them. Cause we, we had cracked the Ford ones, but they had Ford and small block header, headers that have three and a half inch collectors on them, three inch diameter collectors. And it's interesting when you run different headers compared to those, I would think there would be a gigantic difference, but there's really not. I want to see vacuum secondaries on EFI throttle body. Why do you want to see that? Shorty headers are a waste of money. Why why all why do all the new engines break exhaust studs, but my 80s Willy or 80s Celica engine has no issues? What sort of power loss do you have between long tube headers and a tri -Y? Well, a tri -Y is a long tube header. <clears throat> and, and it depends on which exact two headers you're talking about. What do you think about keeping header material thicker to maintain heat to keep the exhaust gases flow? Is that, is that velocity higher, longer? I don't know that you would see a change in power from that, from a material thickness. To do that, are you going to make the OD bigger also, or are you just going to change the ID? Okay. 
I've heard BMWs that sound like pickup trucks because they have log manifolds for the turbo. But you still get scavenging with a turbo. Honestly, I don't know. I I don't know if you had a long tube header. I think it would depend on it might depend on how far away the the turbo is. I, I still want to run that test. Yes, sometimes you gotta use what fits. Yep. Too high EGT could create thermal buildup in a bay, thus soaking engine and creating potential detonation and pre-ignition. Koenig Sig was a three-cylinder. Is there a difference between a truck Norse NSR versus a regular truck Norse cam? That video is up if you want to see the power difference. The difference is the lift. Yeah, the lift is different. Does fuel pressure have to be above 60 PSI on fuel injectors to run correctly? No. The thing that you have to be concerned with is on LS applications, most of the fuel, most of the flow rates of the injectors are based on 60 PSI of fuel pressure. If you lower the fuel pressure, the injector still works. We've run, the, before these came out, the 43 PSI was the standard uh, pressure for most of the stuff, like for five liter Mustangs and um, five liter and five seven tune port Camaros and things like that. So they will definitely run at lower pressures, but the flow goes down with pressure. Long tubes on a big block A-body Chrysler with power steering. I, that's a little bit of a chore, right? Some collectors, like on NA four-cylinder drag cars, have almost a megaphone. Yeah, we've seen changes in B-pipes, we call them, that look like a Venturi. I assume since they're doing it, it works. It may work on their particular application. I don't know that that's a universal thing. I've ridden in a Drift 350Z with remote mount turbos in 2020. That was fun. Australia, Boss 260. I thought so. I, 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 like, I think we tested a Boss 290 intake manifold. Grand Nationals, 43 PSI. Yeah, all, lot, most of that old school stuff. I imagine a remote mount turbo would get exhaust scavenging, but you lose adiabatic efficiency. I think tri -Y headers do better with a Ford HO 5 liter order than the old Chevy firing order. If you ever do another test with two firing orders, please test 4 into 1 versus long. Four into one is a long tube. You mean four? Do you mean four into one versus a triway on each of the firing orders? <laughs> that that is interesting. Of an LS truck with long tubes because they fit easy. F body Firebird that is lowered quite a bit, a lot harder to fit. I remember putting long tube headers on some of the modular Ford stuff, and then they had to drop the motor down to do it. Change the OD and maintain the ID. I think that that would be a, a better way to do it. Close as possible to the same ceramic coat the headers to keep the heat out of the engine bay, keep it all inside the exhaust. I know when I raced in the Bridgestone Supercar Series, um, Mark Donahue's son, David Donahue, was driving, I'm thinking it was Dynion, it was one of the BMW teams, and their motor had uh, headers that were um, thermal wrapped all the way back. The whole exhaust was thermal wrapped. I, I didn't get a chance to talk to their engineer to find out if that if they actually tested it both ways i don't know if they were trying to keep heat out of it for the racing um you know so, so that it doesn't resonate heat into the driver or if they did it as a performance thing stock 22r is a four and a two to one yeah that's a triway even the block looks like it's two parallel twins pushed together the honda stuff is the b series stuff is all the factory stuff is all triway you should also talk about positive displacement blower combos. The higher the boost pressure, the less gain from long tube header scavenging shows up on the dyno. So you've you've tested that? So as you as you run higher boost, and is that on a roots blower or a twin screw blower? And what is the runner length in the motor in the intake manifold that you're applying that boost to? Uh, 
Uh, Kyle, I actually always wanted to do that test. And I talked to Kenny Bell about doing that, I don't know, years and years ago, because we were having a discussion about um, Vortex superchargers and then Kenny Bell superchargers. And I told them, look, I want to test a Vortex supercharger and I want to run stock exhaust manifolds versus headers. And then I want to do that on a Kenny Bell too. I don't want to do that on a Kenny Bell because I think a positive displacement supercharger is not going to respond to long tube headers. I think that that's a function of the short runner intake manifold, probably not responding to the headers as well. That's my theory. And I wanted to test it and I haven't done that yet. So 123 horsepower for three cylinders is enough to support 96 horsepower. So did you just multiply it by three quarters? Hotter the gas inside the exhaust system, the faster it will flow. If kept it hotter longer, it will increase scavenging between the intake and the exhaust overlap. So you're, you're saying that you think by thermally wrapping the exhaust that we would see some sort of change? Ever use PVC from the hardware store to mock up? On air intake systems, I have. What's the best narrow bearing to run on LS forged crankshaft and H-beam rods, cleavite, coated calico, ACL, coated king bearings, etc.? I don't know that I have one of those that I like better than the others. I've used ACL. I don't know if I've used king. Uh, we've used um, cleavite. Hello from Wisconsin, put junior bed and working on Ravelette for the few hours. I love the sound of 180 degree headers. <laughs> I, I've never tried them. I've never compared them to something else. They do sound good though. Um, the truck Norris versus the NSR cam, there's only about seven horsepower or something. Are we going to see the M90 on a 2V? I'd have to look and see if there's a manifold that would allow that. I can tell you that the, I, but somebody already makes that. Isn't Torque Tech or one of those companies, don't they make that? I was saying supercharger kits. Yeah, let's see. Torque Tech. I thought they did Mustang GT kit. There we go. Oh, Terminator GT kit. We don't want that. Uh, it allows you to install the O3 Cobra blower or any Cobra aftermarket unit on a 462 valve. That's all cool stuff. I don't imagine that that's inexpensive though. I don't see something that allows you to put I don't see anything that allows you to put a um, an M90 on there, though. Can you test an else with a single turbo fed off by one bank? I would like to. I need. I tried that on a big block Chevy, and it didn't work for us then. But I would like to try it on something else. An M90 on a two valve would be good. I just need to figure out the intake situation for that. We're going to be leaving a little early tonight. Let's see. Shorty headers are a better choice than long tubes because they fit and are easy to bolt on. 84% saying no. M90 on the Atlas. That's not, that won't be high on the list. <laughs> the turbo on the Atlas is really the way to go. Crazy to see your dyno testing versus some companies marketing for cams and headers. They, well, I'm hoping that they do real testing. You know, you want, I, I, what I don't understand is I don't understand how a company could bring out a product without already knowing that it works. Like if you're the, the, whether it works or not is part of the design element. 
you you decide, hey, look, we need to we want to make an intake manifold for whatever this application is. Okay, the first question you have to ask yourself if you're part of the design team is can we make a manifold that improves power enough to justify whatever we have to charge for it? So if it's a four hundred dollar manifold or a nine hundred dollar manifold or whatever it costs, what kind of gain would it have to have to justify that to justify that kind of power gain? You know, what kind of cost what kind of cost to power gain ratio do we have there? Because if you des- if you start going down the development phase and you can't make any power, why on earth would you make a manifold and offer it? <laughs> and then you have to fabricate like you know power results or something to you know to help sell it. I just that's just not the way that I would do it. Wouldn't mind seeing results on different like headers on a single or twin turbo. M90 on a 3.8 Ford. Well, they already have that. They did that themselves. One twenty three times 0.75. That's all you have to do. The good companies usually do a good job being honest with the testing. Some of the study shady stuff has some pretty wild claims. Yeah, I've seen some of that stuff. Although I think that that, I have to say that back when I first started in this industry, that that was probably more prevalent. And the reason for that is that we didn't have the internet. Um, It wasn't in full swing. And so you didn't have people that would actually, and we didn't have, and chassis dynos weren't everywhere. So when those two things combined, you had people that are like, look, you said it was going to give me 24 horsepower. And I went and tested it and it didn't do that. So not only can they test it to find out if that claim is actually true, but then with the internet, they can go tell everybody about it because they're part of a forum or a group where that specializes in that car. And so if you, if the manufacturer gets a bad name in the LS community or the Ford community or the Dodge community, it's going to be hard for them to sell that. And they realize that. And so that was a good thing, I think. What would you rather have for a daily driver, a Gen 3, third Gen 5.7 Hemi or a 5.3 Chevy LM7? I, I have an LM7. <laughs> so the, the one that I have, I guess, I don't know. I, I like Hemis too. I'm a big fan of the Hemis. Have you done an M90 swap on a Honda K-Series? No. The, the one that we want to put the M90 on is the J-Series. Celine used to always cheat on the tests. That's not good. 2000 Suburban with an Elm 7 sold it. Sold it at around 300, 375,000 miles. Is that what you're talking about? Didn't there used to be a kit on the M90 on the Ranger Explorer 4 liter? I don't know. Maybe. Have you seen the new PTR carbon intakes? Yeah, they sent me over photos of that. Looks similar to a Holly High Ram. Wonder if it makes power. The carbon intake manifold has been out for a really, really long time. So that, that I have that video up where we tested that. And it, and it works really well. And it, and it was full of, theirs was full of carbon fibery goodness, which is nice. You know, it's, it's expensive and I didn't really want to touch it because I didn't want to scratch it. And they have, and I and I tested the new one for the LS3, which that worked really good. And then they have the Crossram dual plenum ones too, which I don't think I've run one of those, but I would like to. Ford had an M90 on the Ranger offered by the dealers. Okay. Oh, I, I think people are pretty satisfied with. Uh, uh, no, we don't want <laughs> we don't want shorty headers. Maybe maybe I'm responsible for that. Ford has a D-stroke 7.3 Godzilla brought down to 6.9. So does does that mean now it's going to rev? Because D-strokers are all the rage. I was talking to somebody about that a few days ago. I told them that that's what they needed to do. Long tubes. I don't mind going super slow over every speed bump. Yeah. Whenever you take a, um, it's funny if you're at the wrecking yard and you look at, you find something that has long tubes and you look underneath it, you're like, Oh yeah, he's been, he's been hitting that thing pretty hard.
I want the best intake for my F body without cutting the firewall. I think I'm going to have to pull the trigger on an LSXR. That is the best one for sub 7,000 RPM power. Taking an LS7 or LSX, that means the 60 will end up in more junkyards. I just hope Richard moves on to something different. He takes us along with him. Well, what am I going to move on to? Always give it the full stroke. M90 on a J series should be fun. You could probably make a plate for the intake similar to the high ram. I'm somebody has to have already done that. Factory SRT exhaust system is 2.75. Is it safe to say it's actually two and a half in the crimson bends? I, I don't know. I don't know what the change in flow rate is if they have bends. I thought that any more factory stuff would be mandrel bends and not um, like pinch bends. But the, the factory SRT eight exhaust manifolds flow really well that we've, I tested those a lot for the Hemi book that I did. Up to this point, do you believe the Godzilla has been a failure for Ford sales wise? I have no idea. I, I don't even know what vehicles they come in and, and then have no idea how long they've been going or how many they've sold. So I would be the wrong person to ask. Uh, total side topic, but have you played the 7.3 liter gas? Is that the Godzilla that you're talking about, Mark? My shorty block others kept melting my plug wires, just went to Corvette style Rams horns on my truck. Yeah, that's probably a pretty good idea. And the thing that I like about stock exhaust manifolds and even shorties is that you, it's pretty easy to make turbo stuff out of them. Lots of M90 setups on J engines out there. That's what I thought. I thought that people would have already done that. 7.3 gas pushrod engine. Oh, so is that the... That's a 460? 429. 7.3 is a Godzilla. That's what I, that's what I thought I said. Some Rams, Rams horns actually flow pretty good. There's somebody on Facebook that is doing um, airflow testing on truck manifolds and because because i have that truck that i cut apart but i cut it this way and he cut the top off so he could flow the ports and then find out what the change in flow is with the lid on and off which is cool stuff i have a full system from srt8 shorties to resonators will it kill my five sevens bottom end if i install it are you comparing that to what if you're comparing that to the ram exhaust manifold it's better everywhere I, I am doing 8.1 stuff. Just want to do a J in a Honda Insight. So I'm going to get rid of our poll at 84%. Don't get scared. I would agree. I don't think shorty headers are the way to go. Got a set of C5 Z06 exhaust manifolds and look pretty good, but don't think they work for turbo manifolds because of the tri wide design. A any exhaust manifold that gets all of the exhaust to the turbo works as a <laughs> works as a turbo manifold. Long tubes definitely make more power, and and more power everywhere. The SRT eight manifolds are also pretty heavy, but they're kind of like a mid-length header. So they're not shorties, but they're they're not logs like the like the Dodge Ram truck manifolds are. But they're not full length ones, but they did they did pretty well. I haven't done Mark, I haven't done anything on the Godzilla. Not familiar with it at all. I don't know that I've ever even seen one in person. I certainly haven't seen any of the wrecking yard. I have some 8.8 .8 stuff that I'm also going to test, which will be cool. Torque tech. And what I was going to say about the 4.6.2 valve is 
judging by how <laughs> judging by how much response I got from posting that blower test that that Ford Racing did that that manifold casting that they did that had the I thought it was an M90 it might be a 112 rotor pack in there I can't remember now but um, at any rate people love that they the 462 valve guys love that That engine was supposed to overtake the Coyote for the aftermarket. I don't think it's doing that. Got my Z50 up to 55 miles an hour. That's fast. That's faster than my 90. Kind of saving the Z06 manifolds to try in a C4 Corvette with an aluminum 5.3 swap. That'd be a good. That'd be a good idea. It the packaging's tight in those. Remember guys trying to do turbos. The guys from HP doing turbo kits and those was was kind of a pain. And in a Corvette, you, you needed it because the Vipers came out. So in, in a C4 Corvette, you, you needed some power. They need to put the 7.3. Need, they need to put the Godzilla in more, in more cars. So what do you got? And I need to get going, but before I do... Um, what do you guys think if they took a, a a new Mustang and took out the Coyote and put a Godzilla in it? Would it be faster than the Coyote? The nice thing about the Corvette is when you lift the hood, you can sit on the you can sit on the wheels to work on it. I want to see a six point eight or V ten. Me too. V ten Dyna would be cool. So what do you think? A coyote would a coyote still be faster than a a Godzilla in a in a coyote Mustang? It wouldn't be, no. Coyote would be better. Coyote's pretty pretty impressive, especially the new ones. Coyote's gonna make more power than a Godzilla. I would kind of like to see, I need to ask Brian that now. Um, I think that they've run some coyotes. Uh, I want to see, what I want to see is an engine dyno results from a coyote and and from a um, Godzilla and see what's happening down low. Is the, is the Godzilla a lot better down low than the, than the coyote? Waiting for Calvin to get the North Star going. Wish there was an inline six cylinder based on the K series. There needs. I wish that the V8 was with the, the K series based V8 would be cool. I know the guy was doing that, but I don't know if he's got it running or working. K series stuff is good. Makes lots of power. And on that note, sadly, <laughs> it is time to go. But I'll be back tomorrow morning with another whole another video. I still haven't figured it out yet, but I need to um, I need to get something going. And it needs to not be four eight or three point eight based. It's got to be something else, something new, something exciting. So we'll have to figure out what that is. But I will see you guys all in the morning. Bam, 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 bam.